Good morning, friends. I'm Pastor Ray. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Many of you have heard that places of worship are able to open up to a certain capacity. And I want you to know that church leadership and I are going over all the information on how to go about it, but we don't have a timetable yet of when we'll be back or what it'll look like. In the meantime, we're going to be sending out a survey to you um, early this week, and it'll be available on our website because we want to hear your thoughts on how we can better serve you. Okay? Now, today, we have special guests speaking. Our friends Dan and Carrie Weens from uh, South Africa will be sharing about God's overflow of abundance and how that brings hope to the hopeless. And we'll be getting a great update on the Inundo development as well in South Africa. All right, enjoy. We are so excited for you to be joining with us today. At this moment, I would like to invite you to worship God with your tithes and offerings. You know, in the Bible, it says that God brought increase to Abram, who is also known as Abraham. And the very first thing that Abraham did to show his gratitude for God was that he brought a tenth of his increase to the king, who is also a priest. And since Jesus is our king and our high priest, we can bring our giving to him where he receives it through the church. And as you put your trust in Jesus with your giving, we are continuing to believe with you that God will continue to bring increase to your household. Now here are the ways for you to give. You can do online giving by visiting www.eastridge.ca forward slash give. You can also send a e-transfer to finance at eastridge.ca. You can set up pre-authorization giving with office at eastridge.ca. Or you can write a check to East Ridge Church and mail it to our church office. Please hold your giving as I pray for them. Father, I thank you that you are a, such a good and loving God. I thank you for every person who is putting their trust in you with their tithes and offering. I also thank you for every person who is giving, not giving out of necessity, but of a grateful heart because of what you have done in their lives. Lord, as you receive these tithes and offering, may you bless each person in ways that only they would know that is from you. And Father, I ask that you will bless each tithe and offering, that may it be a sweet-smelling aroma to you. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, thank you so much for your faithful giving. Here is our message. Hello, everyone. We are Dan and Carrie Weens. We are global workers with EMCC World Partners. And we're just really excited to be able to tell you a little bit about our work uh, in Africa today. So uh, I was born in Canada. I studied music and, and education at university. My first career was teaching music in the public system. From there, I went on to lead worship departments at churches in Edmonton and Calgary. And then 10 years ago, God called us to Africa uh, where we're, we're bringing hope to the hopeless. Um, but our, in our whole adult lives, we've been growing food. We've had a vegetable garden, really passionate about that. And I'm really interested in the intersections between faith and food, growing food, looking after the poor and looking after God's creation. My name is Carrie. I was born in Zimbabwe, so I have a background in living in Africa. I lived there till I was 13. I studied business in Canada. That's where Dan and I met each other. And I'm very interested in sort of the strategic nature of things, the big thing, the big picture things, how everything is connected. I also love storytelling. I love photography, uh, capturing images that, that portray um, reality, that speak um, about what's happening. And I love the fact that Africans have such unique cultures and I love to see um, Africans thriving. I love to see the continent reaching its potential. So for the last 10 years, we've been based near the east coast of South Africa, uh, near Durban, which has approximately 4 million people. We have an interest in equipping people and this has led us uh, to establish the Anando Model Farm in Outer West Durban in September of 2019. We're building a growing network of leaders within KwaZulu-Natal and other places, Ethiopia and so on. But uh, in South Africa, you can see how the towns and cities where, where we work um, uh, and expanding our influence through training our me and mentoring um, 
the model farm is really central to uh, the places that we work in KwaZulu Natal. We have an incredible passion to express the Christian faith in ways that contribute to a holistic transformation of our world. We're working to develop networks of leaders that will be able to transform the African continent and beyond. So we're going to start looking a little bit back earlier on to our time in South Africa. Um, we moved there in 2010 and in 2013 we had the opportunity to go to Zambia for some training. This was a training of leaders um, event and we met this group of Zambian women. And I have to tell you at the time in 2013, Zambia was really struggling because there had been a drought. There hadn't been a rain for at least six months and the ground was arid and dry. I mean, you can get a sense of it if you just look in the background. There was almost no green anywhere. And it was difficult. People were really struggling. Families were struggling, food was scarce, and it was a really difficult time. We found ourselves asking the question, what message of hope do we actually have in this situation? We were acutely aware that people needed to know that the Christian good news spoke to more than just their eternal destiny. In that moment and at the time in their lives, they had very pressing practical needs and these needs that were not being met were preventing them from experiencing the abundance that we know is part of God's character. And so it seemed absolutely necessary for us to be prepared to engage in all aspects of Zambian life, the physical, to understand their hunger, the unemployment and the poverty that they were experiencing, their social needs, the divided communities, the hoarding of resources and the jealousy that was happening in amidst the scarcity that was present, the mental and emotional struggles, the lack of dignity that people were feeling because of being unable to provide for their children, the disempowerment, the doubt, and the hopelessness. And finally, and most importantly, the spiritual, because there was a significant amount of fear in people's hearts. The, you know, thinking that there was superstitions around why this was all happening and feeling out of control, not being able to have any control on what was happening. So we're asking ourselves the question, what message of hope do we have for these Zambian women who work hard for their families and yet face so many obstacles to thriving? The question is, what hope should we bring? Nelson Mandela, um, who fought for equality and freedom in South Africa, reminds us that our work is not done when he says, as long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality exist in our world, none of us can truly rest. And Kofi Annan reminds us that we're actually not immune from the impact of suffering in remote parts of the world. I think if you look at the COVID situation, you can see how a virus that started in Asia has the ability to impact the entire world and we are all interconnected. So this quote is so profound. It says, extreme poverty anywhere is a threat to human security everywhere. So going back to Zambia in 2013, where we were involved, we were involved in, in training in three different communities, uh, training really desperate and, and poor people. Um, but we were teaching people how to farm, how to grow food in harmony with God's creation instead of working against it. We were teaching them how to increase the fertility of their soil, to protect the moisture that, that comes, to prevent soil runoff, to uh, help the soil to improve and, and bring uh, and heal and bring life and health uh, to, to the plants that are growing so the plants can look after us. Um, and also how to make uh, high quality compost using materials that are readily available for free uh, right around us. The good news that was brought to these communities resonated with the people uh, very strongly. You could see in their faces, some of them for the first time had hope that their lives could get better that they didn't have to live in desperation day to day. They were given this tangible new hope. So what if the good news of the Christian faith could be seen and touched? And then is the faith that we share a tangible thing? Um, all through the Bible, God expresses his heart for the poor and the vulnerable. It's all through the, the law and the prophets and in the New Testament. And in the book of James specifically, 
uh, James describes true religion as looking after the uh, widows, orphans, and the vulnerable in their affliction. Jim Wallace has this quote that says, the Bible insists that the best test of a nation's righteousness is how it treats the poorest and most vulnerable in its midst. And then we're reminded that Jesus came to actually rewrite our ideas of success and prosperity. He speaks very specifically that the rich are actually poor and that the poor are rich. And so it's this flipping of the economics of the kingdom that Jesus was very much about. And Franklin D. Roosevelt refers to this. He says that the test of our progress is actually not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it's whether we provide enough for those who have too little. We also do, um, we're training trainers in Ethiopia uh, and we were invited in 2017 to uh, train Bible school teachers from all over uh, Ethiopia. We spent a week with almost 300 Bible school teachers there. Um, we were, were working with the Ethiopian Kala Haywood Church. It's an evangelical church, very large and growing fast in Ethiopia. It's a church of about um, 8 million members, um, 9 million actually, over 8,000 congregations throughout Ethiopia. They have 250 Bible schools. Um, it's, a this didn't, it's a huge church. Mm -hmm. And this church was born out of um, uh, evangelical missionary efforts from the last century uh, from the West. We've heard people say, well, isn't our work in Ethiopia finished? Surely we can hand the work over uh, to the Ethiopian church that's thriving and growing. The problem with, with this idea is that Ethiopia today can't feed themselves. They can't grow enough food for their, uh, to feed themselves. They're totally reliant on aid. That's true for most Ethiopians and it's true for uh, church people, for church leaders. It's true for everybody. And that's despite the fact that most people in Ethiopia farm. 85% of people farm. Most pastors farm, most teachers farm. Um, so the question becomes, is our work done when people aren't experiencing the abundant life, when pastors can't support themselves and can't feed their children? Isn't, is there something else that needs to be done? Is it is it adequate to say our job is done when pastors, when teachers, when evangelists can't support their families from the meager incomes they earn or the crops that they're trying to grow? Where is God's provision for the church even in Ethiopia, let alone the rest of the population? Is it enough to say our job is finished? Mm -hmm. So we have this incredible opportunity to change our thinking from one of charity to one of partnership and advocacy. Our job is actually not done. Uh, there is such value in partnering internationally with the purpose of bringing a fuller expression of God's kingdom to bear. And Nelson Mandela refers to this clearly. He says, overcoming poverty is actually not a gesture of charity. It's the protection of a fundamental human right, the right to decency, sorry, to dignity and a decent life. Even more so, it's important to find ways to integrate our thinking um, and, and examine our, our thought patterns around some of these issues. The Green Movement is very uh, popular, as we know. Um, what, what is the church saying about caring for the planet? For example, Ban Ki-moon reminds us that integrated thinking helps us to see that global challenges are interconnected. For example, in Africa, we see that land, land degradation leads directly to poverty and lack of food security prevents economic growth. Ban Ki-moon said, saving our planet, lifting people out of poverty, advancing economic growth, these are one and the same fight. And certainly from a Christian perspective, we know that God wants his kingdom to come to bear in all of these issues. They have spiritual roots and they are interconnected. Yeah, and I would just say, specifically right now when the world is facing this huge focus on racism and we're seeing um, the, you know, the terrible events that have been happening in the U.S., you know, that's another aspect of how everything is integrated. So many people have been talking about how protesters are being forced to protest because of their lack of food security, because they don't have access to the means that other members of different cultural backgrounds in, in the U.S. have. And so we really do need to think of all the different ways that things are connected. Mm. So in the Lord's Prayer, 
we pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. But have you ever considered what the kingdom actually looks like? There are parables that talk about the value of the kingdom, its contagious nature, its exponential impact, and it's, you know, it's like the pearl of greatest price, the yeast that will work its way through the whole dough. But can we actually see expressions of God's kingdom here in this life? Can we see the world changing in like a way that is visible? Well, we have found this picture in Isaiah 61 particularly helpful in presenting a vision of kingdom transformation. Jesus actually used this passage in his life, standing up in one of the synagogues to say that he was the fulfillment of, of this passage. So this uh, prophecy in Isaiah of the kingdom coming says, the Lord has appointed me to tell good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort those whose hearts are broken and to tell the captives that they're free and to tell the prisoners that they're released. He has sent me to announce the time when the Lord will show his kindness and the time when our God will punish evil people. You know, we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to bring comfort and freedom here and now? So the passage goes on to say, I will give them a crown to replace their ashes and the oil of gladness to replace their sorrow and clothes of praise to replace their spirit of sadness. Then they will be called trees of goodness trees planted by the Lord to show his greatness. They will rebuild the old ruins and restore the places destroyed long ago. They will repair the ruined cities that were destroyed for so long. Where do you see the transformation in this passage? Because there's so many promises here and these words are like tangible physical changes that you can see. What, it, what could it mean to replace people's ashes for gladness? And how tangible is this idea of rebuilding ruins and repairing cities? I, I can even think of many cities in the world that could be rebuilt. You know, this is the transformation that we're talking about, the transformation in this life here and now. It's the sign of the coming of the kingdom. Goes on to say, instead of being ashamed, my people will receive twice as much wealth. Instead of being disgraced, they will be happy because of what they receive. They will receive a double share of the land so their happiness will continue forever. I, the Lord, love justice. I hate stealing and everything that is wrong. I will be fair and give my people what they should have. Yeah, people actually sometimes get comfortable reading these verses, feeling guilty that maybe wealth is not an appropriate desire for a Christian, or they misread them and feel entitled to God's bank account. Well, what stands out to us is that God's heart is not that he give people what they feel they deserve, but rather that he gives people what they should have in keeping with his fair and just heart. He actually longs for his people everywhere to receive his blessing. It says, everyone in all nations will know the children of my people and their children will be known among the nations. Anyone who sees them will know that they are people that the Lord has blessed. When we look at Africa and other countries in the global south, do you have a sense that those nations are blessed? Now, honestly, can we, can we say that? Most likely not, because we see, and what we hear from Africa is more famine, disease, war, violence, slavery, and oppression than thriving and prosperity and security and blessing. We've, we've even heard people talk about Africa being a cursed continent. Yet here in Isaiah 61, there is a clear correlation between the children of God and a visible expression of abundant life through health, justice, happiness, and blessing. We ask ourselves the question, shouldn't Africans be known as the people that the Lord has blessed? So our mission these past 10 years has been to learn ways of bringing God's kingdom to bear in all its fullness. And so you can see here these words coming up on the screen, this very tangible abundance. There should be signs of abundance, of freedom, of happiness, of thriving, of flourishing, of provision, of transformation. If we're not seeing these things, then the kingdom isn't coming in its fullness. We've become convinced that um, if the good news is not applied to every area of life, if it's not impacting all of society, or, or all of a community or all of a family in every way, it's not really good news at all. 
No, we cannot claim to have good news for the prostitute if there are not alternatives for her to provide for her family. And there's no good news for the child laborer unless that child can actually be rescued out of slavery and returned to a family who can feed every mouth. Salvation for the criminal is superficial unless there's opportunity for employment, educational enrichment, and welcome reintegration into society. Can you imagine a criminal who's saved, who goes into society and is ostracized, especially if they may be a person of race, um, of, of a racial um, minority. minority? Yeah. Eternal destiny for the farmer does not feel like a blessing when year after year his current experience is hunger and crop failure. It turns out there's more to doing good than just hating evil. And also doing good is, is a complex task. We need to educate ourselves so that we don't end up doing harm like we see uh, many, uh, in, uh, many NGOs who think they're doing good are actually doing harm in the process. Yeah. So in January 2019, Inando Development was born. It started with a small shoot like that is represented in, in this picture. Inando is intended to be a practical expression of what whole gospel thinking is about. Inando means overflow, and our English word inundate actually has inando as its root. And the idea behind inando is flooding and deluge. It's almost like opening the floodgates of heaven. Well, the dream of overflow begins with these restored individuals who participate in vibrant community. They are able to care for the land and natural resources, and their stewardship results in this new life. And you can see in this diagram, the rings of, of the earth are represented as the people standing on it, and the rings around in the diagram represents the sky and the rain and all the resources that come from above. And then the beauty of these shoots thriving in that sort of situation. The efforts of these restored individuals result in overflowing harvests of food, resources, wisdom, joy, and new opportunity. And at the center of everything is a seed. The seed is the source of all new life and it symbolizes Jesus, the Lord of the harvest, but it's also symbolic in the sense that if you're faithful with one seed, God can bring an abundance from that. So the holistic overflow that pours out physically, socially, mentally, and emotionally from this whole idea of restored individuals reclaiming their calling as caretakers of creation is represented in the Inando logo. We wanted to look at things differently. Africa as a continent is rich in resources. At an, and at Inundo, we start with the understanding that Africa has abundance and that responsible stewardship of that abundance can result in overflow to the continent and beyond. And so the Inundo vision is that Africa would steward well its abundance and thereby unleash a tidal wave of overflow to and from the continent. Have you considered what resources are available all to every community worldwide? These resources exist already, or they can be made by what's available in the, in the area. People can even uh, stop resources from being wasted and can learn to utilize them well. It's an incredible abundance. So for example, uh, God provides all of us um, a place to be. He provides land and soil and sun, rain, seed, compost making materials that we're teaching Africans to use uh, all over. Um, we all have time and talent, a talent, and we can be diligent with um, our, the, our time and our talents. Uh, we have relationships and, and social connections. We have access to other people with, with knowledge that we might need to access. Um, markets are an available resource. When people need something that we can provide, that's a, there can be an exchange of goods and, and uh, wealth can be generated from that and we can, we can provide for our families. Creativity, prayer, wisdom, insight, faith. These are all resources that God's given each one of us. What an abundance. Yeah, and you can see that this is a lot more than just money. Like when we talk about abundance, we often think that money is, is a representative of wealth. But 
this is what is available all of these resources and it's a lot richer than just having money so you see, people in Africa can experience abundant provision and flourishing harvests. Here you see pictures of abundant harvests in Malawi, Uganda, Kenya, and Zambia. It is a tidal wave of overflow, and this is what is possible for the African continent. But why aren't we seeing it typically? Uh, most places where we go, we're not seeing this abundance. Why is that? Um, we just want to show you a, a graph here that, that illustrates the challenge. So in blue, we show what happens um, as in conventional farming. The prevailing practices of small holding uh, farmers all over Africa is represented in the blue with the declining uh, yields that happen very quickly. Within two years of farming in an area, we're getting to crop failure status. And whereas in the green with Farming God's Way, we see yields going um, generally up with the exception of that dip that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, the, the problem in agriculture in Africa is profound. Uh, the average African family needs about 1,250 kilograms of maize. Uh, we call it maize, you might call it field corn. That's a, a staple in Africa that provides most of the caloric needs for many, many, for a majority of families in Southern Africa. They need about 1,250 kilograms just to survive. And the problem, uh, problem is an understatement, the crisis is that the average yields for a hectare um, in Africa, and most families would have a hectare or less, um, struggle at around 350 kilograms a year. So you can see there's a, an incredible gap. That dotted yellow line shows that threshold of what the minimum requirements for a family. And you can see in the blue, after the first couple of years, there's a massive gap between what a family needs and what they're actually providing. Whereas for people that turn to farming God's way, we can see yields in the first year, yields 20 times higher than, what's, uh, than what their neighbors are getting on the same size of land. Yeah, and so then there is always the issue that all of your growing seasons aren't the same. And so sometimes there's incidents of drought or floods you know, or locusts like we're seeing in yeah, East Africa now, you these know, sort swarms. of a natural disaster. And the issue with that is for a conventional farming family, they will get nothing during a time of drought. Um, the, the plants just are not resilient enough to survive. They don't, they're, the soil is devastated. The soil is devastated. Yeah. But for um, a farming God's Way family, we can see that they still get a harvest. The harvest is reduced from what they may be getting in a good year, but they're still getting something and it still tends to be above what they actually need. So they sometimes even have extra with which what, you know, they'll be able to put into their business and that kind of stuff. So then you see that drought um, becomes something that people can manage. People become more resilient, more able to weather these, you know, cyclical kind of situations and still have more than they need. So what is this, uh, what is this tool, Farming God's Way? What is it about? Um, we can just give you a, a little bit of a taste of what it's about. The core of what we're teaching is always biblical, spiritual, um, and worldview related. We want to transform people's hearts and minds. That's what we spend most of our time doing. But when we then get to how then do we farm in alignment with God's creation? How does that look different? So um, in conventional, um, what the prevailing practice is, is farmers plowing the soil, they're pulverizing that soil time and time again. Uh, they're destroying that soil structure, they're increasing uh, rain runoff and soil erosion and evaporative loss. Whereas with farming God's way, we don't plow. Uh, we protect that soil structure and we prevent that soil from uh, washing away and from the rains to run off. Yeah, and then with conventional farming, we see farmers burning crop residues, burning all the organic matter around the farm. This leaves the soil uncovered. It results in increased evaporation and a huge loss of the mi microbiology in the soil. Whereas with farming God's way, we're using the crop res residues for mulch cover, and that is increasing the microbiology of the soil. We're making compost from all the organic matter around us, and we're preventing evaporation with our mulch cover. So it's just such a huge difference. Yeah. Um, conventionally in, Southern, in Southern Africa, 
we see farmers planting the same thing in the same place year after year that guarantees pest and disease of note. Whereas with Farming God's Way, we're teaching people to rotate their crops, mimicking God's rich biodiversity in nature through crop rotations, breaking that pest and disease cycle. And then another um, issue with conventional farming is there's no thought into plant spacing. Um, we've got plants all placed all over the place. There's a wastage of inputs. Inputs are broadcast all over the ground. Um, so they're not making the, the most use of what they have in their hand. And with the correct plant spacing, we can actually achieve a plant leaf canopy, which creates further fertility for the soil. It creates a microclimate for the plants. Um, and we're applying inputs only where needed. So the inputs go farther. We're making much greater and efficient use of the inputs. Yeah, better results with less cost. To meet this critical challenge in Africa, mobilizing leaders is essential. That's where we spend not all of our time, but a lot of our time reproducing ourselves in leaders. And, and these leaders understand that God is the source of overflow and he empowers us to be successful with the natural resources that he provides. These leaders are messengers that catalyze new thinking and challenge the status quo. And they can speak specifically to their communities from their own experiences. They are the facilitators of change. And so the Anando mission is to build capacity in people who become leaders committed to being God's transformational agents in our world. When working with leaders and communities, we usually begin with the Farming God's Way tool because it addresses the foundational need for food security and it targets specifically the way people get held back by widely held superstitions and traditional assumptions. If we don't address mindset and worldview, people struggle to make any kind of progress. So we use the Farming God's Way tool to teach clear spiritual principles that are the foundation of deep heart and soul regeneration. And they also lead to social healing and growth. And then the agricultural skill development part of the tool imparts knowledge uh, that we've touched on already. And, and this knowledge results in methods um, that are applicable to local contexts and require almost no cost to implement. And on the practical side, the management principles are discussed, which lead to actual business profit profitability and sustainability. This isn't. This is about economic in outcomes. We're not talking about subsistence farming. We're talking about abundance of thriving businesses of being able to scale up and continually investing back into the farm and seeing huge progress and growth. Yeah, development, not subsistence. We envision that in the future we'll also connect people to other resources uh, that focus on nutrition, for example, healthy lifestyles such as the Health Project, fitness discipleship through Body and Soul Fitness, um, and tier fund resources that focus specifically on training facilitators for community transformation and mobilization. It's so important that leaders understand how to facilitate, to sort of draw out potential rather than being sort of top down and telling people what they, they need to do or where they need to go. So the Ananda Model Farm has enabled us to begin working deeply with interns uh, to train and teach them to see their, their thinking uh, transformed. We're also cultivating a network of over 20 uh, organizations. These are faith-based uh, nonprofit organizations or, and churches who are interested in building transformational catalysts as well. And a key component of empowering people is helping them to see that they have more in their hand than they realize. And so teaching people how to make compost with ingredients that they already have on their properties is such a huge way for them to see that richness and provision can come from things that already exist locally and in their hand. We, we must never underestimate the impact of helping people to see that God is a personal God of provision and he's the God of all sufficiency. This, this act of empowering people unlocks incredible potential. And here's a, a quote from one of our interns in his broken English. Uh, I just love this quote. He says, I will fulfill my dream of one day being a businessman and running my business so that one day some stores or, or people and uh, I'll give 
I'll give people lots of plants like spinach, vegetables, and fruits because I've learned that you can survive if you use your mind and your hands because God has a purpose for us. He had a plan for me. He knew that he had something in, in store for me which shows me that all the time God loves me. Love that. So in March of 2019, we started looking for a property that would become the home for Inando. We had dreamt of this idea of a model farm for three or four years before, and we were led to the Asagai Valley. Here you can see a satellite photo of the Inando development property, and we've divided it into five sections to help you sort of visualize how the property is going to be used. And we're gonna take you through section one, section two, section three, four, and five. The property is very long and narrow and it actually slopes up into the hill. So down by the road on the left is the lowest portion of the property. And if you were to stand at the bo bottom of the property, you would look all the way up to sort of the different five sections. So here's section one looking down towards the road. And you can see on your right, um, that's where we have our now our permanent dry land field crop demonstration, non-irrigated. Uh, on the left-hand side, these terraces were already uh, there. Um, in fact, those terraces were put in many, many years ago and they, they're going to work perfectly for us. So on that second terrace, uh, we're getting ready to plant our permanent mixed vegetable demonstration and then just above that, our compost making station and uh, we hope to put a seedling nursery in there as well. And this next picture just gives you an idea of what that field portion of section one actually looks like when it's under development. You can see the maize crop sort of coming up behind Nosisi, and um, you can see her holding there in front of, of, of her this incredible um, harvest of beans that came from the bean crop. Mm. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see here the green beans and the maize growing in the rotation strategy. That green bean portion will shift to a different portion of the field every single year. And then to the left of that maize, uh, you can see where we've cleared an area, getting ready to put in some vegetables, our compost making station. Um, and also uh, on that level, we've put in five uh, rainwater harvesting tanks. This rainwater comes from uh, the house and, and the garage. That will be for our drip irrigation system for vegetables, uh, just to save us time. Obviously the poor aren't going to start with a, a, a bank of tanks like, like we have here. They're going to be irrigating by hand, but we want to demonstrate um, a place to go to, a place to save so that they can invest in their businesses and maybe invest in their own tank one day, just to save them some time uh, in irrigating their vegetables. Yeah, and there are government programs in South Africa and I, I believe in other countries as well where tanks are subsidized and so you can even start with one tank connected to the side of your house and use that with a watering can to water all of your vegetables. So we're just trying to demonstrate there's so much rain that comes from the sky and we don't realize how much of it just runs off. When you actually begin to catch it, you realize what an incredible resource it is. And so teaching people that they can catch what God is giving them. Part of God's all sufficiency. So then above section one, we have section two, where the house and the garage and the Anando offices, you can see a couple of the tanks there um, where we're harvesting uh, rain off those roofs. You can see the, the tanks here. And, and the water in those tanks, we can dump any time to, uh, to the green tanks for the vegetables. And if, when those tanks are full and are overflowing, that water automatically goes down to those green tanks as well. Yeah, we actually have six tanks now around the house and we use a lot of our water during the rainy season. The water that we drink, the water that we shower, all of our laundry water comes from those tanks. And so again, it's even been for us this huge les lesson on God's all sufficiency and his provision, because we just had no idea how much water was actually washing away and that we could live with all our water needs being met from rainwater tanks. And then behind the buildings and above is section three. It's quite a quite a large section. Um, here in one part of, this, the, um, of section three, we've planted a, a food forest. Those trees you see in pots have now been put into the ground. We've got all kinds of uh, fruit trees there now. And as those grow and develop and produce, it'll be another, we're just putting putting God's all sufficiency on display, just another example of, of how we can provide for our families by uh, cultivating fruit trees. 
Yeah, and Section 3 seems like an ideal place to build a training room. Um, we're training right now. We started training on the model farm almost as soon as we moved in. Um, we're not stopped training, not having a training room. However, when it rains, it is a bit of a challenge. And we just see that having a multi-purpose area that we can train in, whether independent, would be a great asset to the property. And so we've had some concept drawings drawn up. Um, Eastridge Church has been hugely um, helpful in bringing these drawings to bear and dreaming with us. Um, so you can see here a layout of the building um, and some of the ideas of, of what would be in that building. The main idea is that there is a, a multi-purpose space where 50 people could meet in and could do some training activities. Um, there is going to be a kitchen for food, um, an outdoor bathroom, and then some smaller rooms on the side, which potentially could be used for a farm stall or other such um, you know, farm activities. We're looking forward to the day when we can train a group of people, take them through one, a section of theory, for example, in the classroom, and then take them straight outside to the, uh, to the gardens and implement what they've just learned. Yeah. And so here is a view from the top of the property. And this is just to give you a sense of the slope looking all the way down. It's such an incredible view. You can see section one, two, three, and four all sort of going down the slope towards the road. And at the very top on section five um, are some prayer and walking trails. And we're not gonna develop this particular area, but it is an incredible place for just getting out of the hustle and bustle of life and sitting and watching the view, walking along the trails um, and just enjoying God's creation in all it, of its incredible glory. So we, we moved in at the end of September 2019 and right away started getting ready for, for, uh, for planting for the spring season. We planted um, the first week in November. So here we are getting ready to plant. Uh, we love demonstrating uh, what's possible. And you know, most of our story is just taking land that was unproductive and transforming it into something that um, has abundance. And we can see here, um, we've dug a whole lot of holes by hand and out of this is going to come a maize harvest and a bean harvest. And there's such amazing benefits for, for the methods that we're teaching because we're not using machinery. There's no costly inputs very low startup. I mean, people can literally start this for free and they can start it the next day from training. They don't have to wait for somebody else to bring something. They can go home from a training and they can start the next day. And that can be the beginning of just a new path for their whole family. The, the quality of the food is amazing. There's excellent profitability and the yields that come off these, these plots is 20 times what Dan has said, what conventional farming offers. And the soil is just getting better all the time yeah. because we're teaching people how to look after it, how to help the soil to heal. And we don't see the path fertile. of land degradation that yeah. we see with conventional farming. The land actually improves year after year. And then people also learn the incredible overflow that comes from one simple seed. Um, every year when we plant, it's, it's almost a miracle for us to see what God brings from something as small as a, as a, as a seed. So um, we're just taking you through a few more slides of showing you the overflow that has happened this year, our first year in the Anando model farm. You can see the bean um, seeds germinating, the maize seeds germinating, these small shoots that are, are, are coming up, those maize come straight up through the blanket. And then you can begin to see the, the plants growing, becoming teenagers almost, um, getting higher. We continue to apply mulch to help with our weeding, to help conditioning with the soil. Um, you can see the beans and the maize growing together, um, that absolutely amazing biodiversity, the partnership that comes with the crop rotations. And the maize just gets bigger and bigger and the bean bushes expand and they widen. Um, the color of the maize goes dark and green. And I mean, this is just such a sign of the, the soil that's nurturing um, the plants. And then Jabulani here is showing that the height of these maize plants. And Dan, he's over six feet tall and the maize is exceeding his height. And then finally, the incredible results. The, the 
um, harvest of beans. Here, Nosisi is standing with this huge basket of beans, and we harvested 120 kilograms of beans this year on our first year on this particular piece That's of land. That's part of one day's harvest. Yeah, that she's holding. She's there. We picked about three <laughs> baskets of those a day yeah. um, on just one daily harvest. During the COVID lockdown in South Africa, the community of Ntambamhlope uh, in KwaZulu-Natal was able to harvest food from its community garden because of their diligence in cultivation. This is a community that we've been working with for a number of years now, developing leaders there. And there's about 60 families that are growing food in this valley. And they were able to prov provide food when many others couldn't during the lockdown. This community's increased food resilience has helped them weather the strict lockdown measures and people are healthier from eating this nutrient dense food that, that they're growing from, from their improving soils. We dream of communities all over Africa experiencing the same overflow. So we're coming to the end of our time with you today. Uh, we just wanna summarize a few of our main ideas so that you can go home you know, just thinking about these things and letting them stir in you some kind of action on, uh, in your life. Um, one of the ideas is what hope should we be bringing? What hope should we be bringing to our communities? How tangible is our faith? Are we doing things that can be seen and touched? Our work is actually not done yet. There's lots of transformation and restoration that still needs to happen. What does the kingdom actually look like? Will the world recognize God's people by the abundance and the overflow that's coming from their lives? Are we bringing the kingdom to bear in all its fullness? Are we talking about the whole good news? Are we responsibly helping people? Inando means overflow. Africa has resources. Africa is full of abundance. Transformational leaders are key, building people Helping them understand the capacity that God has given them is fundamental to what we do. And farming God's way is, is the tool that we begin with. The Anando vision speaks specifically of Africa becoming a place of overflow to the continent and from the continent. And we're already seeing the impact extend to Central and South America, to Asia. Farming God's way has been introduced to uh, the people in Haiti, it's just amazing to see. And we're actually part of a network of trainers all over the place that we're privileged to be a part of supporting each other and helping each other, honing each other's skills. But through international partnerships, we've been able to fund trainings and internships like you've seen in this presentation. Um, we're funding for our living expenses and the initial seed money for the Inundo property came from mostly Canadian sources. We are so humbled and grateful for such generous commitment and we're thankful to God for providing for our needs over these last 10 years and enabling us to do what we do. Currently, our strategic focus is, is focused mainly on uh, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, the pro that province and that area, and also um, we're involved in training national trainers for uh, the, the church in Ethiopia, which is, which is incredible. Um, and we just invite you, and, and we're so, um, uh, we invite you to pray with us. We, we just have such a keen awareness of how crucial prayer is uh, for what we're doing, and we're so grateful. So, um, in closing, there may be ways that you want to get involved, and so we just have a few suggestions for you today. Um, the first one is to really think around this area of food justice. Um, Food can be used as a weapon throughout the world. So for instance, why don't you create your own garden and just experience what it is like to cultivate and learn through that what people are going through throughout the world. Maybe you don't have access to a garden, maybe you can work in somebody's garden. Another idea is map food access in your city and begin to understand you know, where food is coming from and where scarcities are. Work with local food banks on ways to help decrease dependence where people need to keep going back and back and back to using the food bank. And finally, investigate food issues throughout the world. Become more knowledgeable about food justice. And, and there are justice issues around food. Governments and multinational corporations are using food um, in, in ways that benefit them financially um, and, and can end up oppressing the poor. Uh, in addition to that, consider this idea that we've 
uh, been talking about today of the whole gospel. Um, it's yeah. Um, so just having this this conversation with people in your church or your small group, how can the gospel impact all areas of life, physically, socially, mentally, spiritually, in every area? Yeah, evaluate um, the integration of your thinking. Try and find the connections on how things are moving together because it's not just one battle. It's not just fighting the green battle. It's not fighting, you know, po and trying to bring poverty alleviation. It's bringing it all together. And then finally, um, as Dan has talked about, prayer is so important. So we do have a prayer group. We rely on prayer very heavily. Um, there'll be some contact information where you can indicate your interest in praying with us. Um, find ways to be informed about the world and pray about those things. And finally, form your own prayer group. Be strategic and really intercede for what's happening in the rest of the world. And then finally, uh, we have people that have been specifically called or yeah, impressed on, upon by God to join uh, with our work financially. So um, we invite you, if God leads, to uh, consider being part of our financial support team. Um, or maybe there's a project in your own community in, in regard to food issues, food security issues, the poor in your community who don't have access, regular access to, to food, and uh, maybe you want to partner with that project financially as yeah, well. Yeah, and we just are so thankful for people that decide to partner with us monthly, even for like small amounts of $30 a month. It's such a huge help when it all adds up. Um, so here are our final um, contact information. We have a website. There's a blog. You can learn so much more about what we're doing. We have a newsletter if you want to let us know about joining our newsletter and keeping informed. Um, but we're just so thankful for this chance to share with you. Obviously, we're very passionate about um, food and Africa and what we're doing. But we're, we're so appreciative that you've taken the time today to join us and just um, listen and hear our story. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.